Sometimes the toughest problems come from the simplest questions. Case in point, is it possible that the Golden Order, that perfect and all-encompassing set of laws that govern our world, is somehow incomplete? How else to explain the existence of such flagrant transgressions as those who live in death? Or the fact that its champions need to zealously conquer competing faiths and assimilate them into their worldview? Why does an all-encompassing order need champions at all? And most vexingly of all, if the order is perfect and complete, how could it collapse? How could the shattering ever come to pass? In the previous episodes, we've described how the Golden Order, inspired by real-world Renaissance humanism, attempted to fit all the mysteries of creation into its orderly system, a perfectly predictable clockwork mechanism of the cosmos. But that was merely a delusion, a self-fulfilling lie that justified the subjugation of all else. In this episode, we'll discover the story and real-world inspirations of the Golden Order's greatest mystic philosopher, and his attempts to finally perfect order. Let's start with Goldmask's biography the man before the legend. Unfortunately, despite his apparent fame, very little is actually known about him, except for a few stories passed down through some of his pupils. According to Corin, Goldmask is a great scholar, who came to the lands between to study and seek the truth of the Golden Order. What's more, Corin introduces us to Goldmask as a tarnished, living outside the lands between. There's something I should mention to you as well. I'm thinking of leaving the Round Table Hold. Do you know of the noble Gold Mask? Though he was but a tarnished, living outside the lands between, he was a great scholar who foresaw the coming guidance of grace. And now, I hear he has come to the lands between alone to contemplate the Golden Order. Gold Mask has come to the Lands Between to contemplate the Golden Order. But more specifically than that, he is coming to the Lands Between in a time during which the Golden Order has been broken, and the Shattering War has devastated the land and its people. He does not yet know its flaw, but Gold Mask is beginning to ask the simple question, how did the Golden Order break? How did it ever come to this fractious age? These are questions that, of course, would one day lead him to develop a mending rune for the Elden Ring itself, but let's return to that in a bit. According to the rags he wears for clothes, quote, Lord Goldmask felt no draw to the vain excess of clothing. What use is finery to one who seeks greater brilliance? End quote. Immediately, this places him in the long lineage of real-world religious ascetics, who would discard the excesses and comforts of civilization and wander the lands in search of a higher truth. This is a tradition that includes many faiths of the world, including Jainist and Buddhist ascetics. For example, even the Buddha himself famously turned away from performative asceticism once he found his middle path. But it has a particularly rich history in the Near East, where Christian ascetics, known as stylites, once spent decades living atop pillars in the desert. And Muslim ascetics, known as Sufis, established a tradition of asceticism and philosophy that continues to this day. Goldmask is evidently modeled off of these real-world ascetics. But one of the many mysteries of Goldmask is simply, where the hell is he going? As we've discussed, he specifically comes to the Lands Between in search of a higher truth of the Golden Order, to contemplate its demise. And once there, he is anything but complacent and stationary. He's no stylite, sitting atop a pillar waiting for the truth to come to him, nor is he a monk, searching deep within himself through meditation to find the answers. Instead, he is actively searching, 
wandering the lands between in search of this truth. We first find him in the Altus Plateau, contemplating the Golden Order. Then we find him inside Laindell, having discovered the Paradox of Radagon. Then he continues his journey all the way to the mountaintops of the Giants, a forbidden land, and a seemingly random destination, but we'll come back to that in a bit. And finally, he returns to Laindell, where his journey tragically ends. So the question is, what is he looking for? Why does he have to travel to find it? For that, we need to address the first thing that truly puzzles Lord Goldmask. The conundrum of Radagon and Marika. To think that Radagon was Marika herself. How would such a thing even have been possible, I wonder? Sadly, I cannot comprehend it myself. In truth, it matters very little whether I understand the Master's thoughts or not. The problem of Radagon is both simple and intractable. How can Marika, the One God, somehow be equal to this mere champion? Certainly Goldmask is not the only thinker in history to puzzle over the paradox of monotheism. That is, how can God, who is one, who is indivisible, also be everything, and be so diverse in his or her manifestations? There is probably no thinker in all of world history who has addressed this question more often more prolifically and more beautifully than the 12th century Muslim philosopher Ibn Arabi. And as it happens, searching deep within Ibn Arabi's story can tell us much about Goldmask. No doubt Korn's enthusiasm about meeting the great Goldmask was echoed countless times in the 12th century by Muslim scholars and faithful upon hearing that the great itinerant sage Ibn Arabi was passing through their lands. Known in the West as Dr. Maximus, aka the greatest teacher, and in the Muslim world as the great master, the same term Koran uses verbatim to refer to Goldmask, Ibn Arabi wandered the Muslim world for 25 years seeking answers to the fundamental questions of existence. Like Goldmask, Ibn Arabi was an ascetic. In Islam, the tradition of asceticism is known as Sufism, from the Arabic word Suf, which means wool, a reference to the simple garments that Sufis wore. Like Goldmask, Ibn Arabi came to the capital from afar, in his case Andalusia, the lands far to the west of Damascus and Baghdad. And just like Goldmask, Ibn Arabi's search for truth begins with a vision that sets him on a quest taking both great sages north of the capital in pursuit of hidden truths behind religious doctrine. Both men searched their worlds for answers as to how their order could have collapsed. In the case of Goldmask, the question is, how could the Golden Order have led to the shattering? Whereas in Ibn Arabi's world, the question was, how could the unified caliphate, the vast empire that the Muslim warriors had conquered in the 7th century AD, and reaching its geographic apex with the Umayyad Caliphate, have fractured into so many competing Muslim states, a seeming contradiction of the Prophet's teachings. In his day, the key disruption was the arrival of the Seljuk Turks, who would come to invade Anatolia and set up their own Sultanate, once again fracturing the already divided Muslim world. But there were also the Fatimids, the Caliphate of Cordoba, and many other rising and falling claimants. So, both men wandered the world pursuing this quest for knowledge amidst the backdrop of political turmoil and fracture, and sought divine answers to the questions of their day. Of course, Goldmask's end is very different from Ibn Arabi's. While the great sage of the Islamic world has spawned schools of thought and philosophy still vibrant to this day, Goldmask's disciples abandon him. And this is where the game's story diverges. The artifact that lends Goldmask his name, the Radiant Goldmask, 
is described as, quote, a mask designed to resemble a blazing golden halo. Its striking design represents both the brilliant inspiration that once shone upon him and the vision of a ring that he will surely find at the end of his pursuit, end quote. Once again, Ibn Arabi's life provides some interesting clarity here. In one of Ibn Arabi's most cited works, titled The Ringstones of Wisdom, he explains how each of the prophets function as a jewel setting on a ring, that altogether hold place the jewel of God's oneness. The Elden Ring's great runes and mending runes, all stewarded or contributed by the various deified protagonists of the game, share that metaphor with Ibn Arabi's revelations. The way a goldsmith might mend how a jewel setting is kept in place becomes, through a sort of magical realism, the literal way we finish the game, offering a mending rune to mend the settings of the Elden Ring of existence. Just as Ibn Arabi sought understanding through visions of divine revelation, so too Goldmask sought to find, quote, the ring at the end of his pursuit, end quote. And, just like Goldmask, Ibn Arabi is associated with the brilliant light of the sun, so much so that he is referred to as the sun from the west. The description of the Radiant Gold Mask is both informative and intriguing. At once, this is a vision that Gold Mask saw, and that he will once again see. In other words, it is both historical and prophetic. But what is it? The mask itself, of course, is a blazing image of the sun. The spots on each side of the mask are, well, sunspots. A clever wink from the developers, as sunspots can occur on both the face and on the actual surface of the sun. So clearly, Gold Mask is all about the sun. That would make the blazing golden halo in the description of the mask a solar halo which, in fact, is a real natural phenomenon that occurs only in higher latitudes, where moisture in the air freezes to form suspended ice crystals. These crystals on sunny days act as vast arrays of prisms that collectively cause a spectacular optical phenomenon that has inspired many a traveler north with its brilliance. And indeed, though he travels far and wide through the lands between, it is apparently not until he reaches the northern snowy mountaintops that Goldmask finally receives his revelation. In this respect, Goldmask is merely the last in a long line of sages and philosophers who come to the northernmost reaches to receive divine revelation. It is no coincidence that he receives his revelation right next to the Stargazer ruins, and we know that the ancient astrologers predecessors to the sorcerers, called the giants their neighbors. So clearly there is a long tradition of northern stargazers, those who looked to the sky for insight. So what's so special about being up north? It's not like they're avoiding light pollution, which would be the answer in our world. No indeed, it seems there are some things the sky will only reveal to those who gaze upon it up in the north. We've already seen one, solar halos, which require ice crystals, but there is another, more famous one, the Aurora Borealis, or Australis if you're in the southern hemisphere, is a phenomenon that can only typically be seen in higher latitudes as well. The aurora, a dazzling display of lights, in truth caused by solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetic field would look to anyone gazing upon the ancient night sky as a genuine river of magic. Indeed, this primeval current, you might call it, was first glimpsed up here in the mountaintops. Surely no coincidence. The primeval current draws heavy inspiration from real-world aurora. The colors of the aurora are represented in the different conspectuses that draw from primeval current study, Solar wind, the phenomenon that causes aurora, is also responsible for the fact that we can see comets, so it's no surprise that one of these conspectuses is dedicated specifically to the study of comets. Human obsession with the aurora is quite ancient. There's even some evidence that the earliest human depiction of the aurora is from a cave painting in modern-day France dating to roughly 30,000 years ago. 
just like the prehistoric astrologers in Elden Ring, who call the giants their neighbors, there is nothing new about gazing up at the night sky and marveling at the aurora. And as it happens, that same solar magnetosphere that gives rise to solar wind also produces the corona and sunspots, the phenomena Goldmask seems to be obsessed with based on his mask. So again, Goldmask is just the latest in a long tradition of seeking divine revelation from the stars up in the mountaintops of the giants. And receive a revelation he does, for it is here in the mountaintops and not before that he begins to, as Corin puts it, doubt the holism of the Golden Order. And it is this doubt that puts him on the path to heresy. It's not long after this that he discovers his Mending Rune of Perfect Order, which reads, quote, a rune of transcendental ideology, which will attempt to perfect the Golden Order. The current imperfection of the Golden Order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed on the fickleness of the gods no better than men. That is the fly in the ointment, end quote. This is more than a little odd. There are two very different things we know about Goldmask that need to be squared if we are to finally understand his story. For one, his entire quest seems to be about finding the sun, as depicted on his mask and the solar halo, and indeed his mending rune is a perfect depiction of a solar corona. But at the same time, his inner struggle seems to be about his burgeoning understanding of the incompleteness of the Golden Order. First, he is puzzled by Radagon's relationship to Merica, then he doubts the completeness of the Golden Order, and most puzzlingly of all, his solution to this incompleteness somehow has to do with the sun. We've spoken in previous episodes about how his mending rune states that the, quote, fickleness of the gods no better than men, end quote, is the imperfection of the Golden Order, and how this fits quite nicely with Renaissance-era philosophy about determinism and free will. To Goldmask's mind, the problem with the current Golden Order is free will, that peculiar human quality, and that both gods and men are afflicted by in this game. So why then does seeing the sun have anything to do with free will? To answer that, we'll need a little bit of tarnished astronomy. For centuries, the notion that the Earth, and by extension, mankind, was at the center of the universe dominated both natural and religious philosophy. The geocentric model had quite significant implications, as philosophical and religious interpretations were also based on this, and Christian teaching at the time centered around mankind's, quote, special place, end quote, in the universe, an idea that seemed to fit quite nicely with being the literal center of the universe. But in the 16th century, a revolution was started, based on the nascent idea that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe, and this revolution would have far-reaching implications. For all you Greeks out there, yes, yes, we know, there were classical and Hellenistic Greeks that had a similar idea before. But most of the world, and certainly the heavily religious world of medieval Europe, believed at this time that the earth was the center of the universe. So when this new heliocentric, that is to say, the sun at the center, model started gaining steam, it met quite significant resistance. Copernicus's book that proposed it was banned by the Catholic Church as heresy. And of course, everyone knows about Galileo's subsequent trial for supporting the idea. In truth, the relationship between the Church and heliocentrism is much more complicated than this traditional narrative. But there's no doubt that this notion ruffled some feathers. But why was it such a controversial idea in the first place? Well, for one, because it displaced man in his privileged place in the universe. No longer were we the center of everything, God's special creation. Instead, we were just one of many planets, and indeed, modern astronomy has carried this notion out to absurdity, with trillions of stars and uncountable numbers of planets 
out there in the vast, unknowable void of space. It may not seem like much to us, but much like Darwin's theory of evolution, which radically changed modern conceptions of morality by situating man's place among the biological world, the Copernican revolution of heliocentrism radically changed morality and philosophy by situating us among the cosmos. Of course, we are not saying that Goldmask is Copernicus or Galileo, no more than he is Ibn Arabi, but these influences are clearly at play, and understanding them helps us to better understand his obscure story. With this in mind, Goldmask's vision of the sun starts to make a bit more sense. He knows the problem, the imperfection of the Golden Order, is man and man's choices. All of mankind's messiness, the ability to make and then change your mind, such unpredictable behavior, is an absolute affront to the idea of perfect order. And yet, it is also the hallmark of man, our defining attribute, free will. And now, this curse of man has even contaminated the gods, epitomized by Merica's shattering of the Elden Ring, and then Radagon repairing it. Such chaos. So, what better way to resolve it than to remove this humanity from the equation? Like in the heliocentric revolution, humanity is no longer privileged. Instead, everything is subservient to perfect, predictable order. Just like the planets orbiting the sun. We are just variables in the grand cosmic equation. If that all sounds a bit fascist to you, well, that's because it kind of is. How much are you willing to sacrifice in order to achieve perfect order? How many other cultures are you willing to assimilate? What kind of differences will you tolerate? Goldmask's answer, pretty clearly, is that he's willing to sacrifice it all in order to achieve his perfect order, a glorious blazing solar halo encompassing all of creation. Encompassing and imprisoning. <laughs>